we are indebted to the ancient Greeks and especially to the Athenians for many contributions to Western culture. We owe to them the great political innovation that has come to be known as constitutional government with political liberty enjoyed by its self-governing citizens. We are also in their debt for their contributions in mathematics, in physics, especially astronomy and mechanics, in psychology and philosophy, and here especially in moral philosophy. Most of us are aware of their achievements in architecture and in sculpture, but comparatively few of us realize our debt to them in literature. The great epic poems of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the great dramatic poetry which consists in the tragedies written by Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, and the comedies written by Aristophanes. There are many other playwrights alive at the same time, but the plays of these four authors are the only ones that have come down to us. And of the, of the 120 plays that Sophocles wrote, only seven have survived. Of these seven, two in particular, his Oedipus Rex and his Antigone, which we have read for today's seminar, are still being played in Greek theaters as well as elsewhere in the world. Aristotle, in his Poetics, his treatise on poetry, singles these two plays out as the most perfect examples of tragedy. The word tragedy itself in Greek, actually the Greek word is tra tragodis, Tragedos, uh, which means a goat song, because in the, in the fall religious <coughs> festival at which these plays were performed, the audience listened to a, a goat song at the opening of the, of the festival. So the word tragedy itself has no particular meaning. It got its meaning, the word tragedy for us got its meaning from the character of these plays that were performed at that fall festival in Athens. What form <coughs> precisely? does a tragedy take? What makes someone a tragic figure? Do you and I ever suffer tragedy in our lives? Do we know anyone who would be entitled to be called a tragic figure? Can tragedy be avoided? Or is it something that somehow happens to everyone in the course of his, his or her life? These are the questions that should be foremost in our minds as we discuss what happens in Sophocles' Antigone. And I'm gonna begin <coughs> by reading you what you have there in front of you, namely the, the, the background, the background that before the play begins, something has happened. Uh, the children, the, the great king of Thebes was <coughs> Oedipus, and the previous play by Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, uh, that king dies. Or another, another play, Oedipus and Colonus. He has, Four children, two sons, Polynices and Eteocles, and two daughters, Antigone and Ismene. Before the play begins, one of these sons, Polynices, with others, attacks the city of Thebes. The other son, Eteocles, defends the city of Thebes. Uh, both are killed in the battle. And the king of Thebes, Creon, as the story goes, issues an edict which says that the traitor, the, the son who attacked the city of Thebes, shall not be given honorable burial, but should be allowed to lie on the ground and be uh, attacked by the vultures. The other son, Eteocles, shall be given honor honorable burial. And again, before the play begins, Creon has promulgated an edict that says that anyone who disobeys this edict shall be punished by death. Is that correct as a background of the story? All right, that being the case, uh, uh, Mark, will you start telling, we'll go around and get other people to continue. Start telling us what happens in the, in the play itself. This is not in the play, but I've just said. It's background, correct? Well, <coughs> Antigone, um, Polynice's sister, decides he's, she's gonna bury him because Polynice is his, her brother. And she thinks that's right, and that's what God would want, and that's even though she right. knows she's just even, the even king. though she knows she will probably die for it because that's what the king said. Mm -hmm. uh, what way? Uh, that's that's Antigone. She has decided that 
There's a conflict between two laws in Antigone's mind, is there not? Between what's morally right and what's lawful. The divine law, or the moral, the moral law, which owes to her brother to give him an honorable burial, and the king's law, which says he shall not be buried, correct? She has to face that conflict of law, and if she decides one way, she takes the consequences of death, correct? Other way, she doesn't fulfill her obligation, correct? Right. Where, where, where does this Maney stand in the story, uh, Laura? I mean, she's also a sister of, of Polynices. Well, she, well she, she says to Antigone, she says, I don't want to get in trouble for it, so don't include me and don't count me in. Mm -hmm. And go on, go on with the story, uh, Buffy. What happens next? The next scene is when a servant comes to the king to tell the king that um, Polynices has been married. By Antigone. Well, they don't know by yeah, Antigone yeah. yet. And then they bring Antigone back, and she doesn't deny that she did it. Yeah. Go on with the story, Laura. Well, so she's sentenced to death. Hmm? And um, Antigone is sentenced to death, and then Ismene comes in. Um, the king says that surely she must be involved in this, too, since she's her sister. Yeah. And they bring her in, and as Ismene says that she did it also. But Antigone says, no, you didn't. You shouldn't die for this, too, because you didn't even want to have a part of it. So while they're arguing, um, Creon just assumes that they're both involved. He thinks they're mad. There, I'll go on with the story. Uh, Creon's son, uh, Haman, Haman. Uh, comes in, and uh, he says that he supports his father, but uh, he eventually tries to persuade him to change his mind and to listen to the people of Thebes, what they the, think. The people are represented in the chorus, aren't they? They're upset. The people of Thebes, who are the fellow citizens, are upset by this, aren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, proceed. Would you proceed with the story now? Uh, Creon, says Darrow, yes. tries to persuade his father uh, to change his mind. I mean, he's issued this edict, but, uh, you know, he may be wrong. Maybe he should postpone the punishment of Antigone. Maybe he should uh, give a clemency. What happens next? Uh, yeah. He changes his mind. Does he, does he change yes. his mind? Yes. Uh, right away? He, he puts her in the prison. No, he puts oh, her in a cave. In a cave. It's just it's like the day. He still condemns her to death, though. Yeah. He just says, That's but he doesn't. Die. Yes? Yeah. yeah. He puts her in a cave yeah. where, where they have her rocked in and stuff, and that's the way she's, she's supposed been, to die. Right. right. So, so Creon has not listened to Antigone, correct? Right. I mean, has not listened to Haman. Right. Won't go get him out. Uh, does anybody else advise Creon that he ought to reconsider? Yes. Prophet Teresius does. Prophet Teresius. What, what does Teresius say to uh, uh, Creon? He says that he's had a, a vision or prophecy that, that uh, something bad is going to happen or ill omens are going to happen. And he says that he should, he should change, he should follow his, that... Uh, Creon should follow his advice and, and remove the girl from imprisonment. In other words, Creon is uh, uh, an attempt to persuade Creon, both on the part of Haman, his son, who, by the way, has a duty of loyalty to his father as well as a duty of loyalty to his betrothed, the girl he's going to Antigone, whom he plans to marry, and he's also persuaded by Creon to hold up this execution. Correct. He doesn't do it, does he? What, what actually happens, uh, uh, Chris, what actually happens? Well, right. Creon goes to where he's, uh, the cave, where he's put Antigone, and there he finds that Antigone has hung herself. She's taken her own life, and Haman is there, and he... Haman is his own son, yes. He, he is there, and he confronts his father with this sword, and Creon flees, and then... Haman takes his own life. So, uh, Creon, uh, as a result of his obstinacy in not changing his mind, uh, not only kills Antigone, but loses his son, correct? Uh, how does the play end? Yes, Duffy? Um, the queen hears about it, and she kills herself. And so then he sees that it's, he's lost everything through his, um, his selfish actions. Or his you think he was selfish? You think Creon was selfish? Um, 
I don't think he's willing to learn. That's his problem. He's not willing to take anybody else's advice but his own. Sandy? Yeah, yes. Uh. Like when his son came to tell him advice and actually, you know, said, I'm doing, I'm not doing what's against you, but I'm doing what's right for you. Mm -hmm. And he, I'm sure, I think Creon really understood what his son was saying, but wouldn't accept it. Uh, now, do, do you think, do you think, uh, Sheila, that it would have been very easy for Creon to change, to say, I, to, to, to announce to the public, I issued an edict that those who buried the, the traitor, uh, Polynices, should be punished by death. I've now changed my mind. I withdraw the. You think it'll be easy? No. Why not? not? At all. Because he's, he stands by his rule and he's the king and he's he should king. go by what he says. Yeah. He's supposed to be respected and people are supposed to respect and believe in what he says. Yeah. Dan? He presents an image of um, a king that's not, you know, not a really powerful king, but a king that's wishy washy. So it weakens his authority, doesn't it? If, if, if all this is happening within what, but remember, all this is happening within one day. <coughs> with one, it all happened in one day, not a long time. And if in the course of one day, the king having issued the edict, then changes his mind, takes it back, the people will say, well, what kind of a king is that? Yes? Not only that, but since Haman was so young, he, would, you know, he was supposed to listen to his elders. And it says and on page 146, yeah. it is not a question of age, but of right or wrong. Yeah. So he's looking at that. What about this mob? Well, I think Creon had to make a decision between what Haman was telling him and what he, he, had already, he had already issued the edict that whoever buried Polynesis would die, and mm -hmm. it's a tough decision for him to make. It is a tough decision. Uh, does Creon, after all this has happened, uh, he's sentenced Antigone to death, uh, his son commits suicide as a consequence <laughs> of that, his wife commits suicide as a consequence of that. Uh, Creon is still the, 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 uh, the, of, the, of the four main characters, two are dead. Antigone and, and, and uh, Haman. Two are alive at the end of the play. Creon and Ismene, right? You're often told that a tragedy is a play in which the leading character dies. As Macbeth dies in Shakespeare's <coughs> play, Macbeth. Hamlet dies in Hamlet. Othello dies in Othello, and King Lear dies. Uh, one thing that usually is taught in high school that a tragedy is a play where the leading character dies. But two of these characters don't die. Creon and Ismene, two do die. Antigone and uh, uh, Haman, right? Now then, uh, you don't have to write this down, but you can think of it. T think of those four characters now. Antigone. It's Maney, <coughs> Haman, and Creon. Which do you think is the most tragic? Which do, just a moment. <laughs> that's quick, that's quick, I bet. <laughs> Which do you think is the least tragic? In other words, I'd like to have you speak to the question of giving me an order and saying, that, that one is at the bottom of the line. There's almost no tragedy there at all for, for him or her. This one is at the top. And g g w what's your impression of that? Sheila, how would you arrange them? Okay, I got and for you. Hey. Which, would you say was the most tragic, which the least tragic, which in between? Or which or you might say which is not tragic at all? Okay. Um, well, I I put Antigone at the bottom. At the bottom. Because she did not mind dying. She said that she was willing to die for, for the, she her brother's burial. With the, with the, the burden of guilt for not. Right, yeah. right. So I wouldn't that really. Was an look. easy choice on her right. part. Uh, Buffy? I think Creon is the most tragic figure. Mm. Tell me why. Because everything he did led to every, all of his actions led to every death, and he's the one that has to live with it, and I think that's the tragedy of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, because of it, him, you would say died. against, against uh, Sheila that uh, even the choice that was a difficult choice indeed for Haman to make, he doesn't have to live with it. He takes the. Right. And, and there's no tragedy for Ismene because, or very slight tragedy, because it wasn't a difficult choice for her to say she wasn't going to bury Haman. And no, no, no problem for Antigone, but you think I, Creon... I put Antigone at the end, too. At the end. Uh, wh where do you stand on that, Mark? I agree with Buffy that Creon was the most tragic. Tim? Um, I agree, too, but I don't think it becomes a tragedy until Tiresias' last speech. Yes, Chris? I agree that Creon is the most tragic figure, but I believe that... Uh, the tragedy stems from 
the personal conflict within him. He couldn't win. To do what was right, to admit he was wrong, there's plenty of people out there mm -hmm. that are willing to push him out of the, out of the kingship. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the moral duty to, he had the moral duty to do what was right when he realized mm -hmm. he was wrong, but he wouldn't admit that. In the position of being the ruler, he wants to preserve. Mm -hmm. Alan, do you think all this is clear? Yes, I agree. I agree with Buffy, too. Anyone disagree with Buffy about that? Any, uh, you, you all agree that Creon is the outstanding tragic figure in this play. And that uh, if there's another one, it, it, who, would you, who would you put second? You wouldn't put Antigone second, would you? Would you all put Antigone at the bottom of the line? Mm -mm. Who would you put second, Ismene or Haman? Haman. Haman. I'd put Ismene. I'd put Ismene. Why would you put Ismene? Because Haman, well, I admit he was tragic and then he saw his bride die and then he killed himself, but Ismene, I think, is more tragic because she's, she not only faces the fact that when she dies she'll be judged in the lower world, yeah. but also she, um, I don't want to say this. Tim? I think Ismene made the wrong choice and Haman made the right choice. Thank you. That's what I would have said, that Ismene would have had to live with the fact that she had not, um, done anything for her brother, mm -hmm. and Haman, he just didn't have any choice. He had at least tried to do what was right. Mm -hmm. Now, Ar Aristotle commenting on this play, Ar the book I told you about, Aristotle's Poetics, which is a book about, mainly about Greek tragedies, has a lot to say about both of these plays by Sophocles, the Oedipus Rex and the Antigone. And he says that the, the, the tragic figure is an otherwise good man who has one very serious fault, and it's from that fault that the tragedy follows. If you think, if you think that, and t that Creon, more than any of the others, is the tragic figure here, can you tell me what you think the fault is, that serious moral fault in Creon that makes him the tragic figure? Yes, Buffy? I think he thinks he has more wisdom than he has. Because Very interesting. Uh, that's an interesting. He thinks he pretends to have more wisdom than he has. Or yeah. Thinks he has more wisdom. He's uh, full of pride. Mm -hmm. About uh, th almost thinks he's in, his judgment's infallible. When, when in fact he's a human being is, in, and is quite fallible. That that kind of pride. By the way, the Greeks had a w name for, and they used that name to indicate the source of tragedy. The word is hubris. H u b r i i r i s with the umlaut over the U, or sometimes spelled H-Y-B-I-R-S. And we, we translate it in pride, but it isn't pride in the ordinary sense. It is this business, as you say, of, of, of assuming greater infallibility than what anyone has. That's, that's his fault, isn't it? Um, sometimes we call that playing God, as if you uh, had the wisdom that God has, but you don't have. Uh, do you think there's any moral fault in any of the other three characters? Anything like that moral fault? Not, not in, in, in Antigone, is there? Not in Ismene? Not in, so that, now if, 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 if you're, yes, please. Well, Sorry. Ismene has sort of a moral flaw in the what, beginning. The when beginning? she's, well, she chose, well, she chose between not going with Antigone yeah. and going by the law, so yeah. she had some flaw yeah. in that. Yes? I believe uh, her flaw at the beginning was that she's afraid of death. That's, that's why that's, she's, she's that's afraid a, of punishment. Yeah. That's a, a quite different kind of flaw or fault than the one that uh, Creon exhibits, isn't it? Lesser degree. Much, much lesser natural, degree. Pardon natural. Me? That's a pretty natural thing. Yeah, yes. pretty natural scare. Now, uh, let me give you some other cases. Um, we now know something about Winston Churchill. I want, I want, I want, I want to know whether you think this is a, a tragedy. Or the, Churchill's a tragic figure. Uh, the English, the English uh, uh, code breakers had broken the German code, the Enigma code, and they knew that the German bombers were going to fly over Coventry and bomb that city almost to destruction. Uh, Churchill was told that. that. He could have prevented the destruction of Coventry by having his Spitfires ready in the defense and rising up to protect the city. But if he did that, he and his advisors felt the Germans would catch on to the fact that the, that the English had broken the code. 
So he had to choose between letting Coventry be bombed or perhaps, perhaps, letting, letting the Germans suspect that the English had broken the Enigma Code and changing the code, which would have had a great effect on the course of the war. Faced with that choice, Coven, uh, Churchill allowed Coventry to be bombed, greatly destroyed. Uh, do you, would, you, would you say, uh, Teresa, in that situation, Churchill had a tragic choice to make and it was a tragic figure? Uh, is, is Churchill, no, no, you're shaking your head, Tom? Mm -hmm. Why not? Oh, well, because in war he had to make the decision that was going to be best for him. Well, no, not best well, for him. Not best, best for him in this country, rather. But, but isn't that a difficult decision to make? Well, it's a dis difficult decision to make, but I don't think it's tragic in that it, he's not losing either way he goes. Uh, Alan? I don't think it's a tragedy. I think it's a misfortune, but I think it's a tragedy because it's, it's obvious what he has to do. You, you think it's perfectly obvious? I think it's very obvious. Because if he, if he let them know the code was broken, then, then they would lose a great amount of intelligence. And more than likely, they would have lost the entire war. Yes? If you don't use the code, what good is knowing it if you never... You never showed them that you know. Well, he, well, I mean, they did use it a lot, but I'm saying. I don't think it will. See, this well, is one, one example where it's either going to get blown or they're going to keep their cover. I don't think so. They could have some. Well, Alan's saying that, well, why don't they use a code when they're, like, say, Churchill was thinking, well, maybe we'll know when London's going to be bombed and that we can evacuate London, use it then, and save more life than, you know, when coming So you think it was an easy decision? Well, I don't think it was an easy decision, but I think it's... Mark, see, I think what you're bringing up, see, I have no, I have nothing to support the fact that they, they, I mean, I'm, they use this code, I'm sure, for spying and a lot of things. They got a lot of valuable information, but I don't have any information to back that up, but I'm sure, you know, they were using it, and they, you know, because they were breaking codes. And I just think this was a, a situation where it was a misfortune, but it wasn't a tragedy because he, he full well knew that if... The, if they did lose the code. Yes. I don't see that Churchill has any flaw that, that leads him to decide one way or no, another. You think the, the, the kind of flaw that appeared in Creon does not appear in Churchill? No. So you would not call him a tragic figure then? No, I wouldn't. I'll tell you one more story. I mean, there's a way of finding out where tragedy lies and what makes a man, what makes a human being suffer tragedy. Uh, President Truman had to decide whether or not to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The alternatives he was presented with was either American troops would have to land on the main <coughs> island of, uh, to, to bring the Japanese into submission, to uh, have them accept defeat and surrender. We'd have to attack, attack the main islands of Japan with a possibly great loss of life. On the other hand, unleashing atomic bombs was has serious consequences not only for the Japanese who were killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but for the rest of the world. Um, he made that decision in favor of the bombing. Uh, di difficult decision indeed. Would you call that tragic, William? I wouldn't call it tragic because I, I think he did the right thing. He did the right thing. How do you feel about that? Uh, Dan. I wouldn't call it tragic. Any more than Churchill? For the same reason, isn't it? Yeah, basically. It's really the same situation, almost. It's, he, he's faced with a, a, a greater evil. If he didn't drop the bomb, there was a possibility of millions of people dying, rather than, like, with the atomic bombings, there, only, there were less than 100,000 people that died. Mm -hmm. And even yeah, if they did on. invade, both Americans and Japanese would, without, die. would die. I mean, I think we'd have lost more lives on both sides if you tried to just invade Japan. Mm -hmm. They would never surrender. There's real no moral <laughs> character wrong with either one of those men. Or nothing there's nothing inside there's nothing of them like, There's wrong. nothing like the, this presumption of infallibility on the part of No, I mean, they, they don't think they're any better. To, I, I'm sure both of them thought a lot about that and probably had a lot of other people give their input. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, I don't think they... In other words, what you're saying, Buffy, and you're make, making us all faces, we, we, we would not call anyone tragic or say that tragedy had befallen him unless it, it flows from some fault, out, fault of his. There must be a fault on the part of the tragic hero and you find no fault with Churchill and no fault with Truman on these difficult decisions. So it isn't, tragedy involves not only being faced, let me, let me put it <coughs> this way, many of the decisions we make are easy. And Tigany thought her decision was easy. She thought that death was much less uh, a, a serious penalty for her than to live with the 
failure of, of fulfilling a moral obligation to bury a brother. That's, an e that's like choosing between a very bright color and a very dark color, or between sweet and sour. But when, as you get near the middle, the, the, the evils and goods on both sides are almost equally balanced, so that no matter which way you choose, you, an evil results. Uh, that's, a, that's the kind of dilemma that the tragic hero or the tragic person faces. But you're making the point that only if, when facing that difficult choice, the person thinks he knows which is the right choice to make and sticks to it against advice that he's tragic. That's your point, Buffy? Oh, well, if that's the case, Let's see if I can see if I can tell you. That that's the case. There aren't many tragic stories. I must be stories, wrong yeah. though, because um, I know I'm contradicting myself. But Creon at the end knew he wasn't right, so I went back to. Well, at the end, he, at the end, he has a he, his, twist. Has a, he's enlightened. He he regrets his. At the end, he, he knew he made a mistake, didn't he? But he has to live with that, doesn't he? Now. Yeah. He has to live with the fact that faced with a difficult decision, he he did not change his mind. Okay, so I. I stick with what I said. But like Creon, he's kicking himself, you know, at the end of the play. He's beating his head on the wall because he realizes how, you know. He could have prevented it. Yeah, how obtuse he was. Not, not, not quite obtuse. Quite obtuse. Because, you see, if you make him obtuse, you'd say that was an easy decision to make. But it wasn't an easy decision. Because as, as, oh. as uh, Shil Sheila pointed out at the beginning, changing his mind abruptly would lose his authority as a king. So he, it wasn't easy to say, well, I'll change my mind and do the opposite. It was a hard change to make in the course of one day, yes? But it was his, his um, feigned wisdom that got him in the position in the first place, thinking that he knew everything in the first place was the reason why he well, said that feigned Don't you think that. originally his decision uh, to give honorable burial to the defender of the city and to give dishonorable, to not give no burial at all, to dishonor the person who's attacked the city is a perfectly good decision for the king to make? Nothing wrong with that decision. In the, nothing wrong with that decision in the first place, was it? Yes. Well, in a way, there is. He should have still given him some type of burial. I mean, he should Why? because because that's going against the gods. See, oh, he, he went he, against them. So I mean, he he could have given some maybe a more honorable burial to one, and and then just buried the other but one. But that yes, yes, the other brother was a traitor. I mean, yes, it's perfectly logical to think that yeah. he's not, he he's not going to like this other god. I mean, yeah. But well, to leave him well, laying on top well, of the ground. Yes. He doesn't have to bury him with full honors and everything yeah. like that. But I mean, he's left him out there to be eaten by the dogs and, and, and the buzzards and things like yeah, that. And that's, you know, in the Trojan War, they didn't they didn't do that. Yes. Hector well, thought it. He thinks he knows what is best for the country. Yeah. In so much as if he says that he is only going to honor the people who defended the city, he thinks that's good. And, and by showing that he dis uh, gives dishonor to the ones who were traitors, and he thinks he knows that that is the best way. He thinks um, his decision is the best way. And once, with that in mind, he doesn't uh, back down at all. Yes. The difference is, though, Truman looked at both sides. He looked at two things, and Creon didn't look at both sides. He just looked at the one side of leaving him <coughs> on the top. I mean, it doesn't see, show in here how he weighed burying him without honors. And well, he might have. He might have thought, well, if I leave him up top there, that, I mean, this will discourage other traitors. I mean, from wrecking harm to our city. Uh, Sandy? I agree with part of what he did, but not the other. Um, I can see why he would not give him an honorable burial and everything and just, you know, but he shouldn't prevent, you know, make it give an order that no one else can, you know, I mean, it's his sister's moral obligation to make sure that her brother's given a burial. You know, I can see why he would leave him there, but he shouldn't prevent others from, I mean, his own family members, his own sister from you know, he shouldn't put her to death for mm -hmm. burying him. So I can see why he did it, but I don't think he should have prevented his sister. Let me uh, to see if we, uh, we're getting at the essence of tragedy, a difficult decision, which uh, you have to choose one side <coughs> or the other, with serious consequences either way, n neither consequence you like. I, I assure you that <coughs> Creon didn't like either of the consequences, either the consequence of changing his decision or the consequence of losing his son and his and his wife. And as, as Buffy keeps telling us, that difficult decision is made with a kind of assurance at the beginning that weakens as the time goes on, assurance because the person presumes to be more infallible than he is. Correct, Buffy? Right. Let me give you another story. It's a story by Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, <laughs> a book, 
uh, a story that I hope you read sometime. It's a wonderful story called Billy Budd. Have you ever seen the motion picture Billy Budd, by the way? Read the book. Let me tell you about. Let me tell you the story and tell me, ask you about Tragic Hero here. <laughs> Billy Budd is a seaman who, during the uh, war, but the Napoleonic Wars between England and France, is impressed into service on a British warship, and he is. Uh, 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 most uh, honorable and respectable young man. Uh, but on that ship, there is a sergeant at arms who's a villain uh, who hates Billy Budd because he's so good looking, so, 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 so attractive to everybody. And he, he uh, goes to the captain, Captain Veer, captain of the boat, uh, or at sea and charges Billy Budd with fomenting mutiny. Now, you know, mutiny on a war vessel, on a battleship, a time of war, is a very serious offense indeed. And the, the British seamen had already, there had been two or three serious mutinies in the British Navy, and the British officers were very much concerned about the mutiny of seamen. Uh, the captain, Captain Veer, calls Billy Budd into his cap cabin and has Claggett, who's the sergeant at arms, accuse Billy Budd to his face with treason, with being a, a, a mutineer. Billy Budd has one defect. He stammers. And because he can't, because stammering, he can't respond to this charge, which is absolutely false, he strikes out and hits Claggett. The, the blow doesn't kill Claggett, but Claggett falls and Claggett falls against the iron of the, 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 the fireplace in the captain's cabin and dies. Uh, striking an officer is a capital offense in the Navy, and certainly killing an officer is a capital offense. And at the point at which, at the point at which uh, Billy Budd does this and Claggett dies, the captain says, you have to listen to the words, the captain says, killed by an angel of God referring to Billy Budd, but the angel must hang because the, the law of the Navy, the, the, the martial law of the Navy is that a say, seaman who either hits or kills an officer is, is to be hung. The um, captain assembles the other, his, his associates, the, uh, the, the lieutenant and the ship's surgeon and, and argues the case. He says, must I not, must I not a sentence, Billy Budd to death, though I know he's innocent. Very much like the story I told you. He, uh, uh, the captain knows that Billy Budd is not a mutineer, but he is an angel of God, a perfectly good man, yet that he's committed a, committed a serious offense. And his colleagues, the other officers say, but Cap Captain Veer, what you can do is put him in chains, put him in chains, we're going into Gibraltar, and pass the buck to the Admiralty. Let the Admiral decide whether or not Billy Budd should put to death. Captain Veer says, I can't do that because the, if the crew, the crew will learn that Billy Budd has killed Claggett. And if I don't execute him, they will think me weak and we may have a mutiny on board. I cannot pass the buck to the Admiral. And so uh, the next morning, Billy Budd is hung from the yard arm and the whole crew witnesses this. And two things happen at that point in the story. Billy Budd, his dying words are, uh, God bless Captain Veer. And the whole crew takes up the, the, the chorus, God bless Captain Veer. The ship goes on, and before the ship reaches B Gibraltar, it's attacked by a French vessel. In that little naval battle, Captain Veer is killed. Bullet hits him in the, in the arm or head. And as he dies, his last words are, Billy Budd, Billy Budd. Do you think that Captain Veer, listen to this carefully, do you think Captain Veer is a tragic figure in the same sense that Creon is a tragic figure? Do you think that, that story is very much like the story you've read in Antigone? You, 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 is, is it clear? You think so? Well, no. You no, I was just saying it's clear. <laughs> I don't know. You don't think, it, you don't think it's the same? I, I don't know yet. I have to think about it. I was just saying yes, it is clear. Yes, to me. I think it's the same because after the deed is already done, he realizes that it was wrong. What he did was wrong.
Yes? Yeah, he knows before that it's wrong. He just knows that he has to do it. Do it. So it's not the same. And yet, and, uh, that, that, his dying remarks, the fact that when Are he dies, he says he, it means it's clearly deeply on his conscience. Right. What a man says that he's dying is <coughs> right out from the heart, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. So he lives to, he lives, he's killed, he's uh, uh, condemned and executed Billy Budd, but he has on his heart all the time, his conscience is bothered by an act that he was forced to do. Right. Correct? What do you, uh, you're, you're, uh, Buffy, where do you stand on this one, since you're the, the lady who called Creon the tragic hero? I think it, he is tragic, but it's not... Not in the same way that no. Creon is? Why not? Because he knew before he didn't want to do it. Befo beforehand, he knew before he even... Yes? Uh, I agree with Buffy, because... <laughs> but Buffy hasn't said anything. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I agree, I agree that... Uh, Captain is, is not a tragic fear, not a tragic figure yeah. like Creon, because the, the reason the captain said that he couldn't pass the buck to the admiral was because he was afraid of a mutiny, and he knew these things were going to happen. And Creon was the king of the city, and it's very unlikely over this one decision that a mutiny in the city will break out, that he'll be, he, he might lose some favor possibly, but it's very doubtful a mutiny might arise, but, but, uh, on the ship, a mutiny is much more likely. I think Creon not only took the laws of man, but more importantly, the laws of himself and what he had said. And um, captain the captain Deere. looked at both sides and tried to reason it out and wasn't actually pointing himself judge um, and saying that he was wisest of all. And so I don't think he possessed really a major flaw. Uh, I agree with David. Well, well, what? Um, the captain didn't have a tragic flaw like Creon did. He didn't, you know, say that he knew best. I mean, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't as much of a presumption of infallibility. Right. Although, if you, if I, I, after I've told you the story very briefly, if you read the story and heard Captain Deer's speech in his cabin at the court-martial when he rejects the other officer's suggestion that he pass the buck to the admiral, he seems very sure, very sure, that what he must do is execute, Billy, hang Billy Budd the next morning. He very seems he almost has the same kind of, shall I say, obstinate uh, against, just as Haman and Tiresias try to persuade Creon to change his mind, those other officers try to persuade, try to persuade Captain Vader to change his mind, and he sticks to his guns. So there's some kind of similar obstinacy in Veer and in Creon. Yes? I don't know if the Captain Roy did the wrong thing, because, I mean, I can find fault in Billy Budd, and, uh, you know, it's, Billy it's, it's is missed. Billy Budd is innocent. But, you know, but as far as the execution for yeah. the murder. Yeah. And it's misfortunate that uh, he reacts to the situation <coughs> that way. But uh, I think he, he did make the right decision in uh, having him executed. Tom? I think Alan was thinking right because Creon was looking to his own, his personal glory rather than uh, Captain Veer was looking forward to see what, what he was thought was right, even though he had to he had to kill Billy Bud. Mm -hmm. He he had a he had a personal feeling he really liked Billy Bud for for what he stood for, but yet he had to he had to do what was lawful. Is they're putting the man the law of man over the law of God and they both did that so mm -hmm. regardless of mutiny or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they both didn't want people to think less of them if they changed their minds. And well, that's a flaw. What 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 too. you what yes, yes please. Well I think that um the king the captain did it in a different way for the fact that he he didn't how can I say it? He did it for to, to save the people and and Creon didn't do it in that way. I mean, he did it for, to, so a mutiny wouldn't break out, so there wouldn't be a conflict. Captain Veer. Captain Veer, yeah. yeah. And Creon didn't do it in that same sense. Greg, Greg? Well, um, you know how you say that the captain's subordinates try to uh, convince him to yeah. pass the buck? Yeah. That wasn't solving the problem at all. That was just passing the buck. Yeah. So, in, in, in that case, uh, Veer would not have made a tragic decision, would he? No, he was just... He, he would was, have avoided the tragedy. Alan? Also, another thing, Buffy well, said that the captain took the law of man over the law of God. The law of God really wasn't brought into this. Billy Budd, after all, he did. Oh, he did, did, he did, he did, did he not? He did kill the officer. He yeah. struck him. He did, yeah, but innocently. He didn't do he it did on not, purpose. He didn't, yeah, he didn't kill him on purpose, yeah. but he did kill him, you see. I mean, I'm all for, you know, I kind of sort of read the book, but it was really hard. But I think, you know, he should have been <laughs> let go, okay? Okay, but, but still, 
in arguing whether the captain is a tragic figure, he didn't take the law of God at all or anything. I mean, Billy Budd did, did commit an offense, okay? Well, Even unknowingly. He, but the captain, that speech of the captain at the moment of the murder, Billy Budd's attack, hitting of the officer, you have to remember those words. At the very moment, uh, Captain Beer says, killed by an angel of God, but the angel must hang. So you have to think of those words. That saying it at that very moment, Captain Veer realizes that Billy Budd is an innocent person. He's not, the, not a mutineer, he's falsely charged, and it's an accident that Captain Veer, that, that Claggett was killed. But but nevertheless, even though it's an angel of God, I must hang that angel of God. I mean, that, that, that's what I have to look at what, Cap, what <coughs> Captain Veer's mind. Well, I disagree with you when, we say, when you say it was an accident. It wasn't a complete accident. I mean, I admit, okay, Billy Budd is an innocent person, and he didn't mean to kill him. But at the same token, he did. And I may be arguing myself into a hole now. <laughs> Dan? Um, if Billy Budd was not com uh, convicted or accused of being a mutineer, falsely accused, I should say, yeah. he wouldn't have been in that office, and he wouldn't have hit the right. guy, and he wouldn't have committed murder. Chris? To put it in simpler terms, it was the same, because <clears throat> they had to choose between their moral duty of either giving a proper burial or... Uh, recognizing the good man or preserving the authority, preserving his authority in the kingdom or pr the captain preserving his authority on the ship. The tragic choice between laws, between the moral law and the civil law, and the law of God and the law of man, Antigone faces that one, or between justice and expediency, the choice between doing what is just and what is expedient. In some sense, uh, Captain Veer faces that. Uh, he has to obey the it, both the conflict of laws between the higher law, the moral law, and the law of the king, the law of the navy, and between uh, doing justice and, 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 and what is expedient. So that uh, human happiness on earth is not a very perfect thing, or hardly a perfect thing, because it is always subject at least to the, uh, the, the, the difficulties and pains and, and the evils that follow in the wake of making a tragic decision. Thank you very much. Can I ask you, did, uh, I have a sense, maybe I'm suffering an illusion about this, but I have a sense that in the course of the five days they've made a lot of progress, that, they, that, 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 that something, they, they've changed. They, today was a very easy uh, talk among themselves and with me. Don't you, uh, would you have any comment on that? I, I've noticed, um, even outside of these sessions, yeah. the opportunity we've had to be with them on the bus, yeah. coming and going, yeah. a, 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 uh, a differing relationship among the youngsters. I think they're beginning to view each other as persons with ideas, mm -hmm. uh, which has broken the, the, uh, the manner in which they've normally related ideas. with each other, yeah. which had more to do with status and economics yeah. and family yeah. and yeah. clique. I begin to recognize people as, as having the right to ideas, uh, which I mm -hmm. thought was a marvelous. Uh, yeah. And yesterday on the way home, they were changing groups um, depending on the topic <clears throat> that the different groups were discussing. If they were tired of one particular topic, and it was a review of yesterday, yeah. if they were tired of a particular topic, they'd move <laughs> to another group. And, and they weren't doing that the first day. I see. I think they're also taking responsibilities for ensuring that their education is appropriate. They are now not critical in, in petty means toward teachers, mm -hmm. but they are critical of the system, saying, why didn't we do this before? Why haven't we been exposed to this in the past? Yeah. And in fact, they pointed out to me when I talked to a few of them, I had had an English class in which we read Billy Budd, yeah. and they seemed very unfamiliar. They said, well, it just wasn't the same. You know, we talked about Billy Budd, but... Well, only one, but only Alan said he'd read Billy Budd. Alan one. was in <laughs> yeah. my class. There were two others who also yeah. would admit to me, yes, we read Billy Budd, but <laughs> we didn't understand it when you talked about it, so it's not the same. <laughs> 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 and right. I, I thought what was exciting, and I, and I do see them beginning to do that, was I think it was Tim in this corner who brought an idea from, I think it was Plato, and he said it is, it is better to do an injustice to another, I, it, yeah. it would be less good to do an injustice to another yeah. than to suffer an injustice yeah. to myself. Yeah. 
And I was, in fact, I was surprised that you didn't pursue uh, that because yeah, it seemed a wonderful You're comment. You're absolutely right. I missed it. I missed it. Shouldn't have missed it. You're quite right. Now, I was just real pleased to see this morning that they were able, as she said, to bring that yesterday, the day before, yeah. all as, together. That you must recognize. As, as seminars go on, if you did this for a year, you'd have more and more and more of that. They said, well, you know, well, three weeks ago we read, we read Aristotle. He said, what do you mean by saying that now, don't you see? They, they'd have all that kind of playback from previous seminars. And it was mentioned in the little entryway uh, just a moments ago, and one student freely admitted, she said, well, you know, I, I was very inconsistent. I think uh, one of the changes I've noticed in them is the need, they feel a need now to defend their statement. statement. That's right. They don't make them without thinking of reasons for it. Yes. That's so, terribly important. That's think, terribly important. I think this has become so natural for them that uh, their teachers were, will see a change uh, next, next week. week. Oh, yeah. It's going it's <laughs> to present well, a real well. <laughs> I really... Uh, what you say confirms my, my deepest insight here, that the introduction of seminars, if you say, how will the Paideia thing come about? If you do introduce seminars from grade one on, it will undermine the rest of the schooling school system. It will undermine it. It will cause changes that will have to take place. And you, you will have students behave differently in class. Well, just think, if this were done in the elementary school, what your high school uh, students would be like. If we're done in the first 12 years, what they'd be like in college. I mean, uh, I've had college, college professor after college professor, I can't get a discussion going. I ask questions, the students sit there with blank faces, won't, won't talk. And that's because for 12 years, they've been sitting there with blank faces without talking. I am still very concerned about the fact that you say this can apply to all students. Well, they're not all going to learn as much. <coughs> the half-pint containers are going to be half-pint containers. Sometimes. That's right, but that's, that's all right. I'm sorry. It well, is that's, that, that, that is the case. But they, they have a thimbleful then, you uh -huh. see. But you've got to take that. I mean, they all deserve this. And if they profit less because they are less, that's fine. They can't, you can't expect them to profit more than they can profit. But, but, but they will profit more from being in this kind of thing than if they weren't in it, you see, at all. Uh, even those less able students are going to, as you say, take part in the conversations and engage with it as they, as they would not otherwise. They wouldn't be in the, in the conversations at all, you see. So I, I, I'm, I don't have any fear at all about taking the whole population. You need an exciting teacher. Well, you, you, you know, can't have a dull, yeah, insipid right. person. All, all teachers should be exciting. <laughs> but they look, aren't. Look, uh, <laughs> learning is contagious. If the teacher... I've often said in other circumstances, if you give a lecture in a dull uh, monotone, as if you were just performing the business of reading, everyone goes to sleep. You have to give a, when you give a, when I give a lecture, I do so as if my soul depended upon it, as if uh, every, never my body is involved, and everyone keeps awake. I mean, I mean I'm awake and they're awake. You, you've got to communicate your own excitement about the thing or they don't get excited. But that's why these teachers have to be like that, and I think they're well, most of them. That's, that's what teaching is. Most teachers aren't. Some. I disagree Some. With that. Okay, Some. I, should, I shouldn't I say most. Okay, you're right. I, I Some should. Aren't. Most okay. people are mostly good. Line three. No, but it, it is important. Okay. Line three. You're quite right. Uh, the excitement of learning is a contagious thing. If the teacher manifests, if the teacher shows that learning is exciting, the children will find it exciting too. You're incredibly sensitive to that. Aren't you? Sure. If the teacher doesn't find it exciting, they won't, they won't find it exciting either. But even at that, I find that you, you always have something as an opener that will pull everybody in well, and everybody can important. identify. Well, that's, I, I repeated one of my basic recommendations. You always have to have a good opener. It's got, uh, you notice I tried that in every case today. I mean, I did it with every one of these seminars has a kind of an opening question. I told those stories to get them into it, you see. Uh, this trick of, they're all used to those words, and by the end of the end of the session, they knew that things they called a tragedy at the beginning were not tragedies, you see? Mm -hmm. But that, uh, and I, I, let me say again, I missed it. I should have ended that seminar by saying, you now remember what you call tragedy. tragedy. The, the things you call tragedy at the beginning, you would not call tragedy now. No, don't misuse that word again. I should have done that, but I didn't do it. Well, I was going to ask uh, when you might have picked up uh, I wasn't really sure, even at the end, that there was a clear definition of tragedy. It wasn't. And, and yet, it's something you might have dealt with the next day, yeah. even in a lecture, right. to have ultimately given them that. Well, matter of fact, uh, uh, let me just say, uh, 
I've been doing this, God knows how long. I learned something today that bothers me, and I'm not sure I understand it. I would have said before Buffy said what she said, but I shouldn't have, because Buffy made a point that I also know. That a tragedy, the, the, the tragedy occurs when a person is faced with a decision so difficult that either choice leads to undesirable consequences. And you've got to make, you've got to make the choice. You can't avoid the choice, and neither, neither choice is good. She said, that's not enough. The person who makes that difficult choice must have a presumptuous confidence in making it. Must contribute to that's the right. thing. Now, uh, in, in those terms, I would have used to think that Churchill and Truman were tragic figures because they had a difficult choice to make. But if they weren't presuming, the way Creon presuming that he was making it firmly and rightly, Alan then they're not as tragic. See, uh, that, that came out today, and I had never quite seen that as clearly before. Uh, so you learn, you learn, keep, if you live, you, if you live, you learn. The, the real difficulty uh, is in, in having enough teachers who have the broad backgrounds necessary in order to conduct seminars. Uh, I think it's easy uh, watching you conduct the seminar. Uh, however, uh, when you recognize that in many cases a teacher would have very little knowledge greater than that those of the students, who are participating in a seminar, unless the, the, the kind of education that teachers receive is, is dramatically yeah. different. I, I think you're right about that. But just think of the other side. Let's suppose now that the teacher has only one seminar a week to, do, to prepare for. That's different from five, five classes a week. And the teacher, the teacher would do some reading that the teacher hadn't done before. Reading, a, I mean, for example, uh, I would think any teacher who was going to read Antigone and Billy Budd would read Aristotle's Poetics on Tragedy and get some input from I me. Mean, there are lots of little books that would become uh, about the books being read that would be helpful as background for the teacher. That's right. That's right. I, I would imagine that uh, in a given seminar, a teacher might need to have a pretty good grasp of five to ten other books mm -hmm. outside of the one being discussed. Yeah. And, and to me, that, that's going to be part of yeah. the difficulty. But it's also wonderful because as I've said again and again, a, a school is, of course, a place where the, the stu students learn. But it's much more important to say a school is a place where the teachers learn, too. And the more the teacher is a learner, the better that teacher is. And w when, when the, the tasks the teacher is assigned does not require the teacher to be a learner, you've done the teacher an injustice, I think. That's why I think this is best of all for the teachers, because it makes them learning individuals.